Today, Dialogues Without Limits receives Teresa Kraus. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you, Pedro, for inviting me. Teresa Kraus is senior editor at Springer, a publishing house based in Germany, but also in other countries like the Holland and the United States. And Teresa is in charge of the archaeology and anthropology books. She's a senior editor there, and she's going to talk today with us about exactly this subject, the subject of uh, publishing uh, archaeology books for a world audience, for a world market. So, Teresa, I would like to start by asking you about the importance of uh, publication for a world audience. Well, again, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think that uh, for Brazilian scholars, that uh, there is so much uh, research that is going on here that would be of interest to a much wider audience. And of course, not everybody speaks Portuguese. So I think the language that uh, people, uh, most scientists, both social and hard scientists read is in English. Uh, so I think it's uh, finding the right publisher who can publish your work in English, but also distribute your work as far as possible around the world in English as well. Well, you raised uh, an issue that uh, the publications in science, hard sciences uh, and biology and medicine are in English, and that's well known. Uh, and there is, of course, um, a common audience for um, diseases or for engineering programs or even math maths. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we go to the social science and the humanities, there is always this kind of uh, complaint or, or worry uh, from scholars in the third world in Brazil and elsewhere, Latin America in general, so that they consider that they ask themselves if people from the United States, from Europe mainly, would be interested in subjects relating to uh, peripheral areas. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, speaking specifically about archaeology, mm -hmm. uh, of course, what is going on in Brazil and Brazilian archaeology, especially when you talk about um, theory, especially when you're talking about methods, techniques, these are the same theories, methods, techniques that uh, archaeologists in North America, in Europe are also using. Uh, I think what would make it a unique case, of course, is the sites that uh, archaeologists are working on. And I think uh, the, the information would be definitely of interest if you're looking at a broader theme, um, if you're looking at a broad theory that, or a technique that uh, many archaeologists are using, even with the newest technology, that would be of interest how you apply it here, but still would be of interest to a wider world. Well, in, in the case of Springer, that is uh, one of the um, biggest uh, publishing houses in the world, and you as a a specific editor for this area of archaeology, and how would you characterize the, uh, the number of books and uh, the interest in such a book by Latin Americans, for example, and mostly so as we are dealing with Brazil and other Latin American countries. But when you're dealing with social science, you're dealing with human behavior. And human behavior, regardless of where you go, is the same. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are in South America, if, uh, if you are in love, you are probably going to behave the same way if someone was in love in North America. So in terms of the social sciences as a whole, you're looking at humans and human behavior, what they made, the material culture in terms of archaeology. I think that uh, Brazilians obviously have been getting a lot of information, a lot of research from North America, and I think it's now the opportunity for Brazilians to present their research, their information, their data uh, to a North American and European and to the wider world audience. Uh, well, you've, uh, you've published several books by Latin Americans yes. uh, in archaeology in, at Springer. So uh, what's the feedback you received in the, the last few years from the, this wider audience about the input of Latin Americans? So for example, uh, we published the Handbook of South American Archaeology, which, was, uh, which has been very well received. There were many, many uh, scholars working in Latin America, not just scholars from North America working in Latin America, but scholars working here, that uh, this, uh, this particular book is one of the most downloaded books that we have in mm. our archaeology program. Um, I, think it's, uh, I think there is a lot of interest in what is going on, as you say, in the peripheral countries, the countries that are emerging, that are developing, that are really starting to put more uh, resources into the research. 
I think that uh, there's a number of uh, publications that we've done that are in Latin American cases by Latin American scholars. And they all do as well as the books and journals that I publish by North American and European scholars. So I don't think that it matters where the scholar is. I think as long as the research is good, that's what really matters. And would you consider that the fact that there is a growing um, Latin American population, not Latin American, people of Latin descent, mm -hmm. Mexicans, but also from other parts of Latin America, mm -hmm. that is growing uh, in the United States. Would you consider that this is, would be a factor? And also the fact that uh, a large part of the uh, uh, United States, the territory of the United States, uh, was formerly uh, colonial, colonized by the Spaniards. Does that make a difference? I honestly don't know. I think, again, it, it really depends. It's, uh, it's the research. I think that, you know, English still is the common language. Even if you are doing your research in Latin America, you want it to be mm -hmm. disseminated to a wider world. And then, you know, unfortunately, researchers in Germany aren't going to read something that you publish in Spanish. Of course, you have many scholars in the United States that do read Spanish. Uh, but I think that they, uh, I think that the publications that they would be looking for uh, will probably be in English because those, for the most, those are the ones that have uh, the impact factor in terms of journals. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that uh, everyone can read. And that's really the point of publishing is to be able to reach as many people as possible. And that even though there are many, many people who do read Spanish, um, I think publishing in Spanish isn't necessarily the way that they want, they don't want to limit themselves no. to just but I mean, Spanish speaking. The, 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 there is a, probably a, a huge interest because of the, the input of the Lat Latinos in the mm -hmm. US, yeah. Lat not only by, by the language, but I mean a culture and links with Latin America. But they, but they are also publishing in English. Yes, the the sure. Latin scholars in the United States are publishing in English as well as Spanish, of course, because yeah. they, are, they are trying to gather to, to catch the scholars who are only reading in Spanish. But they know that if they want their research to be as widely read as possible, they have to publish in English. Uh, another uh, issue that is often raised uh, in Brazil and elsewhere is about uh, the role of books in this era of uh, journals, electronic journals, uh, so that um, there is a, some kind of a, uh, fear that they do disappear and things like that. So what would you say as a, as a book editor? To those guys? I think that uh, books are not going anywhere. I think, of course, what has changed is the move to electronic publishing. Um, I know at Springer, our big push is uh, still, we still have the print book and we will always continue to print books as long as people want them. But I know that our sales department around the world is really encouraging librarians to uh, purchase our ebooks. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, similar to why the journal, why the electronic journals are so popular, that once you have the electronic book in your library, everybody can use it. You don't have to find space on your on your shelf. Mm -hmm. uh, it's available 24/7. You don't have to have the library open at the time to use it. And I think the younger generation, if it's not available electronically, they aren't aware of it. They're not. <laughs> going to find it. Yeah, but I mean, uh, this is uh, a, a general trend towards uh, e-books, yes. but still books, not only uh, papers, not only papers in, 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 journals. in journals. Yeah, I think that, of course, for people's CVs, that journals are very important because it is the impact factor, because it is the rapid uh, publication. But I think in terms of a broader theme, again, going back to these broader themes that people would be interested in, I think a book is a natural place to, uh, to be able to write a little bit more, to be able to bring together uh, people from different areas, people from dis different disciplines to discuss a subject together. And I think it gives uh, researchers uh, a chance to write a little bit more, to, uh, to analyze a topic a little bit more. It's, Journal articles are very limited, but book chapters can be very long. And books themselves, obviously, are very long. I don't see books going anywhere, to yeah. be honest with and, you. And how about um, uh, monographs? Because mm. uh, we have, uh, it's much easier to have some kind of, apparently it's much easier to have uh, an edited volume, because you have different authors, even though there is a lot of work to yes. do. But uh, anyway, uh, how about monographs? Because monographs, do you have some, a single author studying a specific mm -hmm. subject but uh, of course aiming at a theoretical or methodological issue. 
what's the, um, uh, the, the role of uh, monographs in, in, for example, in the series you run? Yeah, I think monographs uh, are, are still very important. I think there are certain subjects that actually find monographs more important than an edited book or uh, even a journal article in some of the humanities subjects. Monographs are still the most important publication. Um, I think with the monograph, you really, again, need to, uh, you have one researcher and their one perspective. And I think it's uh, working with someone like myself to ensure that what you are writing about does have interest of have ap application to a wider world. So it's a lot of the analysis, a lot of the, maybe the theoretical uh, aspect of the research that needs to be uh, included and enhanced so that it's not just three people reading your book. Uh, it's similar to a thesis where, you know, really it is only for the three people on your thesis panel who all <laughs> would be reading that. So sometimes uh, I have published monographs that are based on theses and it's working with the author to see how we can make this into a much, uh, make it into something much more interesting than just your thesis panel. And it is possible. I mean, people are still interested in the monographs that we publish in, in my program. And I'm sure that is true in my colleagues' program as well. So, but there is a, uh, I would ask you about uh, the role of the editor uh, helping the author to uh, change uh, from a monograph, from a thesis or a dissertation, mm -hmm. to become a book. Because as you said, uh, the thesis, there, there are a lot of um, technical details yes. and tables and things like that, that are very focused to the uh, jury. Mm. Uh, and then do you have the general public that would be interested, someone in Germany or in Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, interested in a site in Peru because there are some common uh, anthropological issues? Exactly. I think that um, for me, I, I, I don't do many theses into a monograph, but obviously there are uh, people doing good work even at the early stages of their career. And I think it's um, as much work as you can do at the beginning, where uh, maybe I look at their thesis and say, you know, this data would not be of interest, mm. this data would not be of interest. You did a little bit of analysis here, let's expand on that. Let's bring in more, um, uh, citations and references to outside works. What else is uh, maybe look for more scholars in different parts of the world to incorporate their uh, their discussions, their theses into this work. So I think it's talking, having that conversation at the beginning of the process so that later on when you are writing the book you are already thinking about the international, the global uh, implications of your research. Bringing again into the theory, bringing in maybe some methodology, the analysis that will be of interest to a And also audience. probably com comparative issues. Exactly. This is particularly relevant, for example, in terms of a, a historical archaeology that is the recent past, yes. so the globalization and mm -hmm. uh, issues yeah. that may the apply big, to different contexts. The big themes that are within that particular subject, so globalization, colonialization, <laughs> uh, you know, these are the big things in that, in that subject area and that should definitely be uh, what someone in this area should be emphasizing in their own book to reach for those themes. Well, Theresa, uh, I would like to thank you very much. I, I'm sure that our public is very enticed. Uh, Brazilian authors, possible authors or contributors to the volumes of Springer are enticed by the possibility of uh, uh, publishing with you and also your advice uh, will be also very important. So thank you very much for coming to our show. Thank you very much, Pedro. And then I invite you to the next Dialogues Without Limits.